I'm Mandy DeCecco Calababa, and I am the owner and founder of Collaborative Strategies, a consulting um, business group and counseling um, entity in Lethbridge. And now to introduce to you the speaker for today's session. So, Barry Morishita is the leader of the Alberta Party and a long-serving councillor and mayor for the city of Brooks. Barry is well known in municipal government across the province, having spent seven years on the board of the executive of the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, or AUMA as it's known, and he's become the associated, association's longest serving president in that time. Barry's experience traveling through the province not only as a part of his professional life but also as part of his passion for building communities earned him the honorary lifetime membership from AUMA. He retired from municipal politics in 2021 and soon moved into the provincial arena of, as the leader of the Alberta Party. Barry is a proud Canadian of Japanese descent and is married with two children and two grandchildren living in the city of 100 Hellos, Brooks, Alberta. I think it's funny because he just told me that um, for a long time he couldn't put his name into social media because it has in the middle. <laughs> so I'm hoping that he's going to Morishita, talk some Morishita about the rest of Alberta politics. So welcome. Thank you very much. That was great. I and I do have a sense of humor, and I I will tell you a story about my name as well as the one I I told Carol. Uh, was it Carolyn, right? Carol, sorry. Yeah, Mandy. Yeah, Mandy. Oh, yeah, yes. Mandy, yes. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there we go. So so um, a few years ago, pre-pandemic, uh, the uh, mayor of Cochrane invited me to the outhouse races, and they have they've had these going on as a fundraiser for years, and they decided to have a celebrity version of it. And so, of course, what you do is basically you build a outhouse on wheels or a kind of a facsimile of a house, outhouse on wheels, and you race down this course, down one end and back the other, right? And someone rides in it. Well, so the mayors and some MLAs and some MPs were involved, and my fire department decided to get all crazy about it, and they built one on one of the old tanks, you know, that you pulled with the steel wheels, and, and they, they, they made this massive thing uh, with a hose and everything on it. But on the back, of course, it looked like an outhouse, and uh, so they kind of challenged me, you know, we're gonna make this authentic, so they, they put a porcelain commode in there, and they asked me if I would wear pants so I could leave them at my knees. So there's some really interesting pictures. And then on the back of it, it said more, and then S-H-I-T in giant letters and highlighted, and then the A at the end. And they asked me if it was OK. And I said, no, that's fine. That's good. Let's make some fun of it. And uh, it's, it was actually one of my proud moments because my staff at the city felt more than comfortable to be able to have a kind of just a funny conversation, just like you did with me. And I think that's that's kind of some of the things that are missing in our politics today. So um, while I've had to endure a few things with the last name, it's uh, always been a source of pride for me nonetheless. Anyway, I want to thank you, first of all, for your uh, attendance today. And, and thank you to uh, uh, SAWPAW, is that how you say the? SACPA. SACPAW, that's it. That's the uh, acronym for inviting me. I've been here once uh, before on a Zoom call when I talked about the last municipal elections. Uh, but Knud just gave me your 50-year uh, book, and I was struck by something in it uh, that really speaks to a lot of how I feel about it. I was, I was really um, impressed by this, this headline that says, Community is a Practical Accomplishment. And it talked about your vision of community is not a mere ideal or platitude, nor an object of occasional consultation, or propagandizing by or propagandizing by elites, but as a practical process of engagement in which all are equal and difference is respected. A community composed not of stakeholders or of special interests, but of actual people of all sorts. And I think that's a that's a brilliant statement. And I was and I think a lot of that is missing in politics today, not just provincial and national politics, but politics of all sorts. We have decided for the benefit of ourselves in terms of electoral benefit. That dividing and making people choose a side is far better than collaborating and moving processes forward. Um, we met, heard a little bit about my municipal history and one of the things that I found really, really inspiring about local communities, smaller communities, and I, I think Lethbridge is a community and there's communities within it, 
I could co go to a community and visit, and I visited over 260 of them in my four years as president. If there was a problem that the community had all the levers for, that they, they, they had everything they needed to fix it, there wasn't a time where I went pat back or talked to those elected officials where that problem wasn't well on its way to being solved or had already been solved. Any problem they had that was lingering had mostly a provincial component or had a provincial and a federal component or had a federal component. And that speaks volumes to the changes we need to make in order to make Alberta uh, reach its full potential. So a lot of people say to me, Barry, you know, you had a, a, a good municipal career. They ask me two things, why'd you leave? And sometimes I have asked myself that. And secondly, why the Alberta party? Uh, to the second question, really it came down to looking at what was out there and the Alberta party's philosophy of being a prince, having a principled-based approach to problem solving. We in no way disregard what comes from others. So the budget is a good example if you want to talk about just, just broadly. The budget had some good things in it. Absolutely it did. It made some investments where they're needed. Whether they're successful or not, the details will tell that out, but they did. They, they made some, there were some good things. I think Rachel Notley, when she was in uh, power, made some good decisions, put some good initiatives in place. And the fact that we can't work together on that basis, again, speaks volumes to the changes we need and the things we need to consider. Um, the Alberta Party uh, was started, uh, kind of restarted in 2010. The name itself actually was, was there long, long before. Uh, but in 2010, it was kind of reconstituted. And for the same reasons, back in 2010, a group of people recognized that, you know, we were, were getting to the point where you either had to be with somebody or against somebody. And it, they could see the fissure coming. They could see the conversations changing. And they were concerned about that. Um, and as time has gone on, we've seen our election campaigns, the, um, uh, the behavior in the legislature, the parliament buildings get more and more corrosive, less and less constructive. And I think it's a credit to the people that were there back in 2010 who thought about a principle-based approach. You know, we've got to get past this politically dark space we're in, where people seem to think the wheels will fall completely off if someone else wins. Um, that's not been the case. We've had good government and bad government. We have good decisions and bad decisions. But we can't keep coming back to the fact that saying, if you don't do it my way, the whole place is going to burn to the ground. And if you, you know, we got to the point where we don't even care who wins as long as you lose. And that has just created uh, a lot of angst among the community, um, particularly uh, on both spectrums, whether you're a senior or whether you're a young person, to be looking out for yourself in Alberta. Because I think those things, the important things, the reason government is here is left behind. And I think we have, a, I think we have an opportunity in this election to restore faith in people's uh, view of what politics should be. That engagement should be something that is made because you're trying to solve a problem. That you're trying to make your community, your province better. And I think the Alberta party is uh, something you should consider looking at when you make that choice. And I'm going to start off with governance. So uh, we talked about principles. We're principles based. We're basically a fiscally responsible party. Um, some would say we're even conservative in that regard because we care about balanced budgets. We think you should get value for money. And we think the budget process itself should be open and transparent. Uh, we think when it comes to party discipline that you don't need to whip votes. We think that if you come up with such a horrible idea that your own caucus won't support you, it's probably a really horrible idea. Seems to go without saying, but in these days we can't say that for certain. Um, we also think that MLAs have a responsibility to their, to their constituents and that there are, there are three fundamental things there. One is that you are there to represent your constituency to the legislature in whatever form it is, and no matter what party you're attached to. Secondly, you have a responsibility and individual concerns in your constituency, and that means, which should go without saying, but we're going to be mandating our MLAs to answer emails within 14 days. 
<laughs> and not in a form letter, but to actually say, you know what, we're going to get back to you. We're going to make them have town halls in their communities because that's part of what we need to know. You know, I'm a political history buff, and uh, I've obviously born and raised in Alberta, so Alberta is the one where I watch the most. But, you know, Peter Lougheed, when he was elected the first time, they had six, six members, I think, something like that. And he made sure that his MLAs knew every school board member, every town councillor, every, every Reeve mayor, and they had to know those things. And they had to be in their community understanding what was going on. Because a lot of poor decisions get made when they don't think about you. I've been in those rooms and, you know, had to run out because we need to understand what's going on here in order to make good decisions there. And the Alberta Party is committed to that, a different model of governance, more open, more transparent. Uh, when you shine a light on something, usually you get better results. I think it's called disinfecting in some regards. But if you do that, you are less likely to make poor decisions. You're less likely to make self-serving decisions. Um, one of the things that uh, when I first got into municipal politics that I made a real uh, big priority for me is that if I couldn't go home and explain to my family and my friends what I had just done, uh, you know, I shouldn't have probably done it. And as my time in, as a municipal leader evolved, you're always working on with the group of people you have, you bring those perspectives, you solve a problem, you think you've got it. And then my last consideration before I ever voted or moved something forward was, who does it negatively affect? Is there someone negatively affected by the decision we're making? And can that be mitigated? Because at the end of the day, we're not here to build rec centers. We are not here to build hospitals. What we are here to do is to provide services for you. And you and your parents and your grandparents, your daughters, your grandsons, that's what government is supposed to be doing. And if we uh, are creating a problem for individuals to access, for individuals to be uh, served by that system, then we don't have the right rules, regulations, and legislation, and it should be revisited. So at the end of the day, we care about a good quality of life. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. Kids are so smart <laughs> because they're unfiltered and they tell you the truth. So one of my favorite things to do, again, was always with grade six students was always awesome. You know, we know that uh, and in a municipal level, you gotta provide water, garbage, sewer, uh, all of those things you have to provide. And when you ask a, a young child, 12 years old, where would you rather live? Would you rather live in a place that has all of these things, plus this one has park space, has a pool, has some playgrounds, has some walking paths, has some uh, you know, tennis courts or pickleball courts or whatever they would be, which place would you pick? They always pick the one with the amenities, right? They count on you providing water and sewer and roads, but the communities they pick are these other ones because quality of life is important. What do we, what are we here for? What do we exist for? And I think we forget that a lot. The other thing Alberta cares about right now is how affordable it is to live in this province. You know, we want reasonable cost to, for food. We want shelter. Uh, we want to be able to pay for our utility bills or water or gas, electricity, vehicle insurance, um, tuition, taxation. And the Alberta Party is taking the approach that particularly around what's happened recently, is that we haven't targeted the people that need affordability help the most. So in my own family, as an example, I have one daughter who's a teacher, married to a teacher. They have two children. They own their own home. I have another daughter who's an actor in the city of Calgary, single, rents. How much money do you think my actor daughter, who makes about, you know, $45,000 a year make, versus my two teacher family, which makes around $160,000. They get every benefit, every single one. My other daughter gets nothing. <laughs> and, you know, we should be asking ourselves why. And unfortunately, the worst conclusion has always reached in my mind is because they don't think my daughter will ever vote for them. And that's a sad way to make decisions, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, working couples with no children. People who weren't 65. 
didn't get a dime. You know, if you rented, were a working couple at 64 years old, uh, living on, you know, minimum wage or close to it, you got nothing. Who needs that help? And it's more complicated, I get that. But it's also necessary. And we gotta quit shortcutting to the political statement and make these programs resonate and be effective in the communities that they are held into. I think Alberta's also seeking leadership. They're looking for leaders that are ready to admit when they are wrong. They're ready to gather up people who are smarter than themselves to make decisions. And they're willing to trust professionals and Albertans to bring the input that's necessary to make those good decisions. We need people with lived ex experience in education, making decisions about education. We need professionals in post-secondary to help us with changes in post-secondary. We need people who have been farmers and ranchers all their lives to input into what's going on in agriculture. But far too often, we have a group of people ultimately making that decision that had never hear from those people directly. And that has to change. That could be in itself transformational if we're willing to open up our, our processes to have real engagement with people who know what they're talking about. And that you set aside the political issue for a moment and listen to what needs to be done on the ground. I think that's really missing in Alberta politics. The other thing that's, I think, important about leadership is you've got to surrender authority. You have to be able to willing to empower people down the line, people that are delivering the service to have the resource and the authority to make changes. One of the things I learned very much about uh, Alberta, there are no communities that are like. They're just like people. These communities have assets, they have issues, they have different priorities. But yet at the provincial level, because it's easier, and I, you know, I'll cite an example in a minute, it's easier for them, that's what you get. And that's just not how it works. Sometimes you have the asset necessary to do a certain job. Sometimes you can attract the people that need to do a certain type of work. Sometimes you need different help. Sometimes you need a different model. And again, we don't trust people, I think. That's the problem. We don't trust people at a community level to make those decisions. The Alberta Party wants to devolve that. We think the province should be setting standards and there should be an accountability, particularly when there's finances passed over. There should be an accountability to that. But at the end of the day, the test is going to be whether the community got the service it needed. It doesn't matter if it was delivered in a blue truck or a red wagon, I could care less. The test is whether you got what you needed at the time you needed it. And I don't think we can say that about enough services we have today. So an example of that is when they consolidated social services a few years ago. My community, uh, we have a very young population. We're nearly 40% visible minorities. We have a lot of immigrants. Western medicine, parenting, these are big deals. Um, you know, mortality rates and all those things is a different place to raise your kids than where they were a mere six months or a year ago. And we had some really great programming. And at the time when this consolidation was coming, under the guise of being more effective, and they did make one change that was very positive, they did guarantee three years of funding. So there was some certainty there. But they took three quarters of a million dollars out of the city of Brooks. And I think that was the case in a lot of places. And what they added, which provided no direct service at all, was something called a hub. So they had a big entity that they, so they had to deal with less. So, you know, when I went into social services and spoke to the per one of the people that was helping design this, they said, well, now we only have to deal with, you know, 36 agencies or however many it was. I, I don't quote me on the number, but, well, yeah, that's great. That's way better for you. Awesome. You have to do less work and have less paperwork to do. I want you to come into my community and tell that family of four who has five, four kids, un three kids under three, four years old, that they don't have their parenting service anymore, that they don't have their mentoring service anymore. You tell me how that's better for my community. And he couldn't because he didn't even know. This is the problem with the system. Certainly, it was easier for them. Oddly enough, 
the administration caused the social services didn't go down, children's services didn't go down. I don't know where it got eaten up at, but it's gone. And we're putting more money into it, which we need, but I'm very doubtful about that it gets down to where it needs to go. And that's my theory about every political department. It's, I, I call it the funnel. So we're gonna put $965 billion in health, or $965 million in healthcare this year to do a variety of things. They, you know, things that are good. I think, you know, to uh, uh, shorten times in emergency, to create more surgeries, to, uh, you know, shorten EMS times. Those are awesome things to do. They need to be done. But what's gonna happen with the money, the way our system works is, they're gonna pour the money in at the top of the funnel. All $965 million is gonna be poured into the top. And by the time it gets to the bottom, there's going to be very little that actually delivers a service. And I have seen it happen. I've seen it happen in my own city organization. And we have taken, we had taken steps at that time to mitigate that, but that is what happens. I've got $965 million. I've got to get more surgical suites. I've got to use the, I think the term right now, they're, they're going to push surgeries out to small communities. So how do I do that? Well, I've got 900, I've got 100 million of this dollars. Okay, well, we need to put a couple of people in charge to manage that. Rather than say, hey, doctor and you, you need how, you know, how many hours of surgical time do you have? Mm -hmm. How about if we give you the money, in, 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 you know, not like give it to them, but give you the ability to spend the money, and why don't we allow you to directly book your surgical time in Brooks, where only 10% of the, our time is used up. Doesn't that make sense? But guess what happens? You lose control, you give up control, and at the end of the day, you want to be able to stand at this podium and say, I did this. You don't want to account for all of the detail, you just want to say it. And that is just, ladies and gentlemen, not good enough for us. We cannot continue to spend money without getting a better result, because we just can't do it. We're spending nearly 60% more in healthcare over the last five years, 60 or 70%, I can't remember what the number exactly is. How many of you are getting better healthcare today than you were seven or eight years ago? How many of you? We're in a province when I first got elected in 1998, the, the town of Brooks at the time had a doctor recruitment problem. And we got all the words. We got, you know, they set up these groups and they funded some of this. Um, but guess what didn't happen since 1998? Only with today's announcement, and they haven't been created yet, we actually graduated less medical doctors in Alberta last year than we did five years ago. It takes a 94 plus average to get into nursing school in Alberta. And we're short hundreds of nurses. So all of these things, I guess, point to the fact uh, that I have five minutes left, so I'm gonna finish up a couple of things. It comes down to the fact that we have to do it differently. And the current governments, that we've had in the last two terms have proven they won't do that. They just have proven they won't do it. And so instead of voting next time out of being afraid of the NDP or afraid of the UCP, I'm really urging you all to consider what you want in an MLA, what you want to change, and ask your candidate whether they will provide that opportunity. I can't promise you that all our problems are going to be changed in four years. In fact, I will actually guarantee today they can't be fixed in four years. But we can change the way we do it. We can empower people to get the job done at the front line. We can make preventative, long-term investments in all of the things that gather up our money, whether they be education, uh, social services, or health care. We can do a better job. The people exist, the brain power exists, the ideas exist, government just has to do it differently in order to make it successful. And I'm here to tell you that that's my one promise in this campaign is that the Alberta party is committed to doing it different, committed it to doing it better, and committed to having you involved in that conversation. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. As always, it's time for questions. Are we still, where are we lining up? Still lining up over here? So please come on down. <coughs> Hello. Hi. Thank you, Barry. My name is Henning Mundel. We're 10 weeks out from an election which hasn't been officially called. In that time, how many potential ridings in Alberta are you going to feel, do you feel you're going to be able to field uh, candidates? Okay. Um, so we, we have, uh, I think we have a dozen uh, nominated now. We're hoping to have about between 40 or 50 by the time we get to go. I doubt if we'll have all 87 this time around. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the plan going forward, have between 40 and 50. Maria Fitzpatrick former MLA for Lethbridge East, and uh, I certainly liked what you had to say, uh, but I will say to you what I said to Greg in 2014. What it sounded like was the NDP platform. There was a few differences, and uh, I would certainly challenge you in terms of um, what the NDP did and what the UCP has done. Uh, as an MLA, I answered the phone, I answered emails, I met with people, and you know I've met with you. Uh, and I don't know that all of my colleagues did that, but most of them did. I didn't get whipped by the party. When I disagreed with something, I disagreed in caucus, and I changed it. So I want to know um, if you feel the media approach to what happened in between 2015 and 19 and the media approach now is what dictated what was going on in, in politics. Uh, and that's a good question, and um, and I should be careful. Thank you for pointing that out, because I know sometimes we can make blanket statements that don't apply to everybody, and 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 uh, I, I want to recognize that I did work with some MLAs in my time, for instance, at AUMA, where where we did get good we did have good meetings and we had good engagement. But I can also tell you there were lots that didn't. Um, Maria, I, I agree with you. I think the, the media, the way the media coverage happens, does lend itself to kind of hysteria and conflict. However, I think the more alarming, and I, you know, I don't know how we change that because you know, I was meeting with a person who was a news director in Edmonton and we were talking about press releases because we send them. How many of you read of mine? Zero, probably. Um, and he just said, you know, they don't have the manpower. There's, there's not enough people. They used to have a, they used to have an investigative reporter crew when he first started about 21 in a radio stations in, in Edmonton. Now they had three. And so I think that blends it too. But I also think, unfortunately, I think the, the, the politics of the day have also taken advantage of that and created their own kind of narrative that says, uh, if you elect them, you will suffer. And I don't mind debating uh, policy and process on things, but I really, again, to your point, I made that very same statement and I apologize for that. We can't blanket say everything's wrong with everybody yeah. in order to make it. So I think we're, we're victims of that. We do that ourselves. And I've instructed, uh, for instance, all of my candidates, they are just not allowed to make personal attacks. They just aren't allowed, period. They can take on policy and process uh, as much as they want and point out the flaws of some uh, ideas and decisions, but we will not do personal attacks of any kind. We're not going to put terrible pictures of people up and, and do that kind of, we're not gonna do it. And so I think leadership has to do that. And I would challenge both the NDP and the UCP to take up that lead and quit doing it because it's happening right now. If you listen, I listen to the radio on my way down and if, if, if I had not, if I wasn't living in Alberta, I would think, man, we have like two horrible political parties. We must have because that's all they're talking about. And I, so I think we have to take some ownership of that. Thanks, Perry. Uh, Ian Hurdle, um, you addressed health issues, and I now know that uh, Lethbridge has gone to eight, uh, from six or seven obstetricians to zero as of this past week. 
Um, and the reason I'm asking about it is Brooks, about eight, ten years ago, suddenly had to stop doing cesarean sections because they kind of messed up. And they said, we'll be going again in three months. So I believe it took 15 months to sort of get it going again. And as being mayor at the time, I think you would offer us some insights. <laughs> All right, uh, that, that's a really good, uh, in, in fact, it was more like 19 months. And I, and I unfortunately know of babies that were born between here, Lethbridge and Brooks, on the road a few times because of it. So it had to do with the rules. Um, and, and again, I, I don't think we're, we're very smart about leveraging our workforce. We're not flexible enough. And I, I get it every time we make a different decision, we take some risk on. But we've got to talk about risk versus reward. If we take zero risk, if we make no different decisions, we will get the same. So when it comes to obstetrics, uh, first of all, I, I don't know how a community can live without it if you want to have people there. My daughter actually went to school here at the U of L. She lived in Lethbridge for six years, never came home in the summer. I don't understand why. The wind here was driving me crazy, but she loved it here. And uh, <laughs> anyway, she, she said, Dad, I can't move to Brooks. And I said, How, well, I, you know, I'm planning on having kids. There's, there's no obstetrics in Brooks. Why would I establish a family in Brooks? Good point. So there were two things that happened. One is that the doctors got motivated. Um, so uh, because you need 365 day, uh, 365 uh, days, 24-hour day coverage in order to have a functioning obstetrics program, uh, the doctors themselves did most of the recruiting. That was our saving grace. Nothing that, you know, without not being too disrespectful, but AHS didn't do a ton of stuff for us to help get obstetrics back in Brooks. It was the doctors themselves that did it. And we helped in a community. We paid for a lot of stuff to help establish doctors in Brooks. We, um, we fronted costs. We helped them establish bank accounts. We found them places to live. Um, we did all kinds of things to make it as easy, as seamless as possible to do that. But honestly, it was the community itself that did it. There was no structural changes uh, in AHS that did it. It was the community itself that rose up and the doctors in the community. I give them a lot of credit. But ours are stressed to the max right now, too, uh, because you can't... Um, the way they set out staffing across departments and areas, you cannot leverage strengths of your system unless they are actually purposefully assigned to that system. And I think in smaller communities where you don't have that flexibility, whether it's in eMERGE or obstetrics or any specialty, we need, that, we need to have that flexibility. Um, I was in a, a hospital in Medicine Hat talking to an emergency room doctor who said, you know, the establishment of 50 ICU beds in Alberta was a great idea. We needed more ICU beds. Except they didn't realize what it did to staffing in his hospital. People had to decide which department they were going to work. So when these jobs came up and they were bid, uh, bid on these jobs, then they were an ICU nurse, no longer an eMERGE nurse. Even if there was nobody in an ICU bed, they were the ICU nurse, and they don't have the flexibility to leverage their staff. So again, I think this, the problem has to be solved here locally, and AHS has to devolve some authority and resource in order to make that happen, and that's what we should be trying out. That's what we should be trying out. Barry, thanks very much for your presentation today. My name is Laurie Schultz, and I've asked the, the question I'm going to ask you. I've asked both uh, MLA Shannon Phillips and UCB MLA Joseph Scal. So it's with respect to the long term long term care. Recently, the federal government has come up with guidelines, and I'm curious as to what or how the Alberta Party, uh, what your approach would be. Um, and I guess the only change has been since asking uh, Shannon and Joseph is that Doug Wiley's report, the auditor's report, has come out. Um, and I believe um, he termed the staffing approach to long-term care to be that of a fast food restaurant approach. Uh, very concerning. But I'm just wondering if you could provide what the Alberta Party's approach would be to long-term care. Okay. Um, that's a really great question. Um, and one that I've been involved in for a while. I was chair of the Newell Foundation, which is our, our lodge of facilities in the county of Newell for a long time. And so we saw a lot of these things change. So 
first of all, there was a really good report done uh, on continuing care that had some really great ideas in it. And I'm kind of hopeful that the change in the Continuing Care Act will put some of those good ideas in it. Um, so I think we have to, again, change the way we do it. So one of the problems with continuing care is one, there's, there's a lack of capital for sure. There, there's a lack of places to go. Um, and that needs to be addressed. And I think there was some money put aside. How that translates into beds is yet to be determined. We don't know. But, but I think one, you, need, you do need more money and a longer term vision of how many spaces you need. Secondly, we have to approach continuing care differently. And to start with, we need to put a preventative lens on our investments. We need to get people to stay independent as long as they possibly can. And that, and again, there is some investments in home care. However, we don't know how that's going to roll out. And I'll give you a good example of why working in the silos that we do. So we have home care and then we have accommodation. We have health and we have accommodation. We have health, home care and accommodation. None of those really work well together. So here's a good example. So in the Newell, Law, Newell Foundation, the New, Newbrook Lodge in Brooks, there's about 160 people live there. About six or seven years ago, home care decided they weren't going to pay for foot care anymore. They said, we're just not going to. You gotta do it on your own. We had a lady come in I think once every three weeks uh, at whatever it costs a day for somebody who does foot care. They're not a podiatrist or anything, they're just doing preventative foot care, cutting nails, you know, doing the things they do to prevent infections and those kinds of things, pretty basic. We really, we said, well, how do we do this? How do we change this? And they said, well, we can't, we don't have it in our budget to provide it anymore. So we had two people end up in the hospital with, because they couldn't walk or had infection. Now I know that what it costs to be in my lodge is a hell of a lot less than what it costs to be in acute care 200 meters down the street, but we don't think like that. So first of all, we have to put preventative care as a forefront piece. So that means uh, I think we have to allow more care in independent settings. That means more at home, more in independent living like lodges and those kinds of things. I think we need more preventative care options. Obviously we need more doctors to do that. There's a long curve here, but certainly at the base level, that's number one. We have to talk about preventative care. Secondly, we have to get rid of the ass assessment process the way it is. So one of the people that had their foot problem, when they were done in acute care, they were assessed. And they said, well, you can't walk to the bathroom by yourself. You can't stay there anymore. Well, that's where her supports are. That's where her friends are. Her family comes in. Sorry, we, you have to go here. So we have to get rid of that. And we have to deal with what the community has for assets, what the people need for care. So I think the assessment process has to be changed. And then thirdly, I think we have to, uh, we have to put um, more, uh, allow more innovation in the care model. I think we have to spend less time worrying about the temperature of the hot water and more time worried about the quality of people that are in the facility. So rather than training these wonderful people who monitor water, we should be training nurses aides and stuff to be able to up their uh, ability to care for people. So we have to make, again, different investments. Um, we're going to peak here in about 2030, 2035. We're going to have one in four is going to be a senior citizen in, this, in the province of Alberta. And we, we won't be able to handle it because we don't have enough runway before we get to acute care to take care of it. So if we start prevention now and we keep people one more year in their current setting, that will do more for us than if we hire a thousand nurses or put a 50,000 continuing care, long-term care beds in. So we can make those investments now. And so I think that's, that's our approach. You've got to be preventative to start with. You got to try to push against that change as quickly as possible. Thanks, Mary. And a very good presentation, I felt, because I think Alberta does need more parties uh, but I'd like to, you to address this polarization, which you did a little bit, and the divisiveness in our, in our province right now. You either have to be one way or the other, but for sure with the current government, you don't want to be siding with Ottawa about anything. <laughs> so, 
and yet they they kind of kept us going during uh, the pandemic. So I'd like you to speak to how do we counteract this? Because as a Canadian, Albertan, and Lethbridge resident, I love them all. So stop picking on my country. Can you deal with that issue? It's big. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, it's it's really difficult to say that there's some way to deal with it except to just stop. If it was our kids, we'd just say stop that, or else you're not getting dinner, or you can't go to the show. But apparently. You know, the stick we carry isn't big enough. That, that's a problem for sure, because we want to blame somebody. And just for the record, in the budget of last, this last year, we're getting like 13 or $15 billion from Ottawa, plus the health care deal. So the fact is, is there, which is, you know, almost uh, about, just about 20% of the budget. It's coming from federal transfers. So I know that some people don't want to talk about that, but that's the truth. It's right in the it's right in the documentation. Not highlighted, but it's in there. So when it comes to polarization, I think two things. One, so I, I can tell you that since I've got into party politics, I don't like them. I really don't. I, I, I the the structure of them itself makes that divisive nature part of the part of the problem. It's really hard not to get sucked into it. And Maria, I don't know what your background was before, but you probably saw how that. Sometimes you're pulled into that, you know, being across the table, so to speak, and somehow we've got to get over that. I often say that if we had $65 billion in this room today to spend, and we listed the parties, we'd have a hell of a lot better plan than what we got in budget 2023. We would. <laughs> For one thing, we'd be doing it in the open, everybody would be hearing what we're saying, and then secondly is that our vested interest is the people around us, the people we care about, and, and that's that's it. And we're not going to change that until we vote differently, to be honest with you. I, I You know, um, I, I've looked across the province, I, I've picked ridings, I actually picked Lethbridge East, oddly enough, when I was doing some, and to Lethbridge's credit, they've been far more open-minded for to consider other options than some of the rest of the province, so I'll give you credit for that. You've had liberals and NDs and PCs and you see you've had quite a variety of people representing this community and I think that's to your credit because I knew some of them or most of them at least to some degree and some of them I knew really well and they were good representation so I think we have to vote differently I think we have to be thoughtful about our voting and we have to practice being less responsive um, I often get criticized on social media because I do not go up there 13 seconds after somebody says something and I don't. I do that purposefully. I have a 24-hour rule at home. When my kids were growing up, if that piece of garbage was on the floor, I waited 24 hours before I yelled at my kids because if it was so important the next day, then I should damn well pick it up myself. But secondly, like, why do I want to have a yelling fight over a piece of paper that I was just mad about? And that's what we do. So we need to be less reactive and more thoughtful. I, and I'm committed to that. I don't know. The, the, the dark part of that is I'm not sure how successful it will be. Uh, but it's really up to you guys to make that, to make that happen. Is vote for somebody who's going to be thoughtful, who's who's going to commit to being not reactive, and then, you know, we'll change it one pace at a time. Leona Jacobs. So when I was working in post-secondary education, um, occasionally I'd have conversations with students <laughs> about politics and they would ask me on occasion, you know, who should I vote for? Now I have my bias, uh, people know me, they know I have my bias, um, but what I advised them was that they actually don't look at what's on offer given any election, that they actually look deeper to find out what the value of a given party is. Now we have in my thinking two very distinct value systems governing our decision making currently. We have at the center of attention the dollar, mostly oil and gas dollars, at, to the exclusion of pretty much everything else. And on the other hand, at least I like to think this, we have all the same concerns, but at the, at, at the anchoring the decisions are, is the welfare of the people. So. Great talk, loved the philosophy, <laughs> which may be a political difference, right? But okay, that's fine. Um, hope, hope good things for you. But what is the values 
what are the values of the Alberta Party? So, so I think that's, I, I, if I didn't make that clear, I think, I think it's people. And to your point, you know, on that, on that, at the end of the day, we want people to succeed. That's the only way the province is going to succeed. I think, you know, in terms of value, um, I, I think like what guides me anyway, and I'll speak about this personally because it is personal, is that I need to be able to go to everybody in my constituency and say, you know what, I spent your money wisely for this purpose and that I did balance the need of us to have a, uh, an approach that allows sustainable opportunity, so we make sure that we can afford food, we can grow food, we do all those things, but that the person is at the end of it. We have to make those changes. Um, so I am committed to that. that. That's always guided all my decisions. And maybe on that one, I, you know, like I said, we're aligned a lot more with the NDP when it comes to that type of thinking. Um, but I think on the other portion of it, I think, you know, you can say whether we're aligned more conservative when it comes to money, but I think we're, uh, when it comes to that, I think we need to be able to open up that opportunity. So when it comes to revenues, for instance, the Alberta Party has stated, we're open to looking at modernizing the revenue system. That doesn't mean, and people always say, well, that means a sales tax. Not necessarily, but it could. We're willing to be open-minded enough to consider that. Um, and, you know, uh, I get politically advised, we can't even say it, well, it's the truth. Uh, I speak the truth. I think we have to modernize our revenue system. And again, to make statements like those specifically to exclude those things are disingenuous. And they don't really allow us to advance the conversation. So from a values proposition, I think we're willing to be messier maybe, a little bit more open about what needs to be said and have that conversation in the open than the other two. And you know, politics is a game. I heard that today on the radio. Politics is a game. Um, we just think it can be played a little bit better uh, and more openly. And so I think I trust people to make good value decisions on their own. And I think we have to be open as politicians to let that conversation happen. And I think that's a big differential between the two. Um, like I said earlier, I think there's great ideas that come from both sides. There, there, were, some, there were some initiatives that happened uh, in between 2015 and 2019 that were good initiatives. And we're dumb, to be honest, if I, I can't, to just roll them back because that creates instability and creates problems. So to be kind of vindictive and mean about it is not our way, but uh, I think you have to find a balance. But um, at the end, it does have to be about people, I think. That really is a big part of it. So, but balance is important. So my name is Mark Edel. I was going to ask you about a provincial sales tax. I was going to ask what the view is. All the other provinces have one. And we're on a roller coaster. Oil revenues are up. We build schools. We build hospitals. Oil revenues are down. We close hospitals and uh, all that problem. But I think you answered it to a certain degree. Uh, but do you think the provincial sales tax would be the answer to try and level up their uh, income and so we get off this roller coaster? Uh, so I don't, th I don't think it's the only answer. I think we have to modernize the, the, the system. So there's a couple of things we need to consider when we do that. So the Alberta Party's platform is no small business tax. It's, it's a very small amount of money and we waste a lot of time and effort collecting it. Um, we do think there's got to be a balance between. We, we think you can maintain a competitive corporate tax, but you don't have to be at 8%. I think that has to be considered to, be, to go up. When it comes to a sales tax, there's all kinds of interesting ways to look at it. And, and I'm not an economist, um, so I don't know. But you know, the things that we've looked at, uh, particularly in small conversations, I think are worth pursuing and looking at. And uh, uh, the tourism industry is a good one. So Banff, Jasper, and Canmore approached the province a long time ago. And they actually approached your government. And they've approached every government in the last 10 years that I know of with the idea of a sales tax on tourism. The fact is, is that millions of people visit Alberta, particularly those three areas, and pay nothing for the services. And I'll ex illustrate it with Jasper because I know it very well. Jasper is a place that has 4,200 permanent residents. It's not allowed to grow. When they build a wastewater facility, they have to build it to handle 40,000 people a day under the same funding that Lethbridge or Brooks gets. But all those people get to use it. And I'm not saying that there aren't, there's, there's advantages. You know, the businesses make money off tourism, blah, maybe they should pay. 
but we have to come up with a better system to do it. They proposed at the time, uh, I think it was a 1% one, 1 sales tax that would go directly into an infrastructure fund for those tourism communities. Doesn't that make sense? Now, I don't know all like, in the economic ramifications, but the Alberta party would be willing to consider anything that made our revenue more stable in the long run. Our price sensitivity on oil for this budget is $700 million a dollar on West Texas Intermediate. That means if we average less than 70 or around 70, we're in deficit this year already. That's how sensitive our budget is. And that, that can't go on. We haven't balanced a budget without resource revenue since 1981. So to your point, I think we need to look at that because you're right, the services that govern people, we're gonna need university students, we need people to work in hospitals, whether the oil's at $12 or whether it's $112. So we, we, we do have to look at a, a better trajectory for this, for sure, and the Alberta Party's open-minded about that. I have a question from the floor from Russell Gusby. If you think your ideas are correct, and if you think you are a good uh, politician, why don't you join one of the established parties and convince them of your ideas? An intelligent note is not an easy matter. Why complicate matters by introducing a third party? I have, I have a really personal story about this. So um, that's a really good question. And you know what? I did do that. I did explore that. Um, under the same conditions, I thought, you know, there's probably enough good thinking people, we can change the way we do this. But when I was going to, going looking through the nomination process and kind of the requirements and uh, I didn't see how I could do it. Like from what I was told and how I was explained, and Maria, good to your point that if, if you're telling me that you had a lot more freedom in caucus, it certainly didn't look like it, just saying. Um, but. Um, I don't, I didn't see a pathway for that to happen under the, the current rules. I was, I went, I checked, I had nomination papers for the UCP. I even went to my daughter, the teacher, who, as you can imagine, is not a UCP supporter in any way, shape, or form. I said to her, I said, you know what, I know some of these people, and I think, you know, we could get enough people, we could maybe shift the way they think. And uh, she, she, of course, berated me for quite a long time. But, you know, as I went through the process and stepped through and talked to people, I, I didn't see that. The, the, party, the party system, the way it is, is so um, foundationally focused on electoral success. I, I think it, it, it ruins a lot of that. I've seen briefing notes from my time at AUMA where I could not have a conversation with a minister, and this is both governments, that would not deviate from the, the notes they were given. And I, and I know that they had other ideas, and I know that they were thoughtful people, and I, I just didn't see it. So that's why. Um, I'm trying to change the way we do politics, and like I said in my, in my presentation, I may or may not be successful at that, but no matter what happens on May 29th, I'm gonna sleep really well on May 30th. <laughs> Hi, Barry. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm Bev Mundell-Atherstone. Um, I really like the idea of collaboration. When I ran <clears throat> in Little Bow um, in 2012, Everett Tannis was uh, running for the Liberals, I for the NDP, and we had two other fellows who were running. And uh, we felt if the four of us won and got in, we could solve Alberta's problems, <laughs> a cross-party team. So, and I like your idea of all of us here getting all the, all the billions, that would be great. <laughs> but I'm wondering, um, you seem to have a foot in each camp here. Um, I'm wondering what, what is your view on privatization of healthcare? And I'm also wondering what you would do to make healthcare more efficient, what is your platform? Thank you. So, so on first on the question of privatization, I am. Uh, I think we have to distinguish between private and for profit because I think there are distinctions. I think you know, uh, my mom had cataract surgery in the Gimbel Clinic, and well served by it. Got in a reasonable time, got the job done, had good work done. Um, I don't know how the, the dollars and cents worked out exactly, but I think we have to have that conversation. Um, if 
I, I, I don't care what brick or mortar building these things happen in. Um, I do care about value for money and if there's an efficiency to be gained by going outside of the hospital space, then I think we should consider it. I think that's a practical motivation for doing it. Um, when it comes to healthcare, generally speaking, though, I think just like with seniors care, we have to take a, we have to put a preventative cap on. We we have to start making investments in prevention, and that includes things like homelessness, anti-poverty measures, because we know it's not anecdotal; it's the truth. People that live in poverty or have mental health issues end up in our acute care system. They end up being treated and and through that system and we don't make enough investments. We spend 26 or $30 billion on healthcare and we spend very little money on home, homelessness, generally speaking. Your own clinic here, I toured your clinic when it was operating, which was for a supervised consumption site, was an awesome site, except we never invested in any of the service that wrapped around that kept it from being the problem it became for the local community at whatever level that was. We didn't invest in that. That was preventative. So we ended up, you know, having police show up and we had all of those things. At, on one point, you know, we had less overdoses, but we had other issues to deal with. We never invest in those. So we gotta be preventative. I think we have to switch our lens. The acute care system works really well. I've slipped and broken my arm and been in and out of a hospital in Calgary in like 12 hours. Plates and screws and sent home. Works good except you know they're just as likely to put me on that icy road as I was <laughs> that caused the problem in the first place. We need to talk about prevention and I think that's where we need to shift focus. Um, the system can't be fixed overnight but we can certainly drive dollars and one of the things that I talked about before I was even the leader was that a portion of the Alberta health care budget, the AHS budget, should be um, Eventually, it should be mandated how much they spend on preventative care within their own budget. And then it should be increased because I think at the end you will get better results. You will need less acute care relative to how much money you're spending. So that would be our focus, is to focus on prevention to begin with. Last question. Okay. Fiona Jacobs. So in all of this conversation we've had today, good things discussed, but I have not heard mention of the environment and in particular there's two things that are under my skin and itching um, the issue of abandoned oil wells orphan oil wells just the general sort of pock marking of Alberta with respect to oil wells and what will be done about those that have no home nobody taking care of them and the second thing is the whole issue of coal mining or any other kind of mining in our watershed in the eastern slopes so can you talk to that? Yeah, we sure can. So, so the easier one to deal with is the coal policy. We've we've said it's in our it's on our we're opposed to any uh, any new coal mining on the eastern slopes. Period. And we're also saying that the uh, commitments made to rehab mines that currently exist needs to be done, um, and it's not being done. I know certainly in the Red Deer area, the Red Deer River watershed, that area, a lot of the coal mining stuff has not been rehabbed to the point where it was committed to. And that's a function of political will. Um, it needs to be done. So we're very clear on that. There's no, there's no gray area for us. Uh, when it comes to abandonment of oil wells, so f first of all, for you, if you're not aware, 100% opposed to the R Star program or the well site. They, they changed the name to make it com easier. Yeah, 100% opposed to it. It is a strictly a transfer of our money to the oil companies to get it done. And if you're an oil executive, any executive waiting to make money and you know you have a government that's going to come up with a program, what in the hell would incentivize you to clean anything up when you know you're going to get paid for it in a year? The, we have a really bright lady running for us in, in Calgary Northwest. Her name's Jenny Remy, and she's a geophysicist and she used to work in the oil patch. She has some really great ideas. First of all, when it comes to cleanup, the, the, there are two separates. The orphans is a separate topic. But what's currently, so active and inactive wells, so that can, those are wells belong to somebody. Somebody owns them. There are rules now that commit them to cleaning it up. We just don't enforce them. We just don't. And so we need to start that. And one of the ways to do that, and I, I've actually met with them, like oil associations, oil and gas associations, we need to put timelines on them. We need to put timelines on cleanups. 
we have the ability to, to, to collect the money and get them to pay for it, but we don't have an end line. We don't have an end zone. You know, you can be at the 50 yard line forever when it comes to well cleanup because you're not required to finish it by the time the game is over. You can keep going. So timelines are something we'd have to do. The, in the, the, oil, the orphan well is another issue. Some of this is so old and legacy back that you know, we, are, we are on the hook for some of it. But the oil companies have also made commitments to commit certain amounts of dollars to the orphan well program. And my information is, is that if they actually followed through and did the work, for today's, inven for today's inventory, they, they would take them about 13 years of current funding level in order to do it. But they still have to do the work and it has to be demanded at work. Uh, there is one kind of bright light. I don't know how it's going to work. There's varying degrees that you can nominate places to be cleaned up because they've just been left for years and years. I don't know how effective that's going to be. Again, the AER has a big role to play in that. They have the tools, they have the legislation, they have the hammer, but they just don't use it. And we would say you have to do it. That's your agreement for being on the land. Um, and uh, that would also go towards municipal taxes and lease payments. You made that agreement when you stepped on here, you have to follow through, or you're not being licensed in Alberta anymore, plain and simple. Like, the tools are there, they need to be used. All right, thank you very much, leader of the Alberta Party. Um, good luck in the upcoming election. Um, there are some thank yous that I missed in the middle of this, so make sure you buy your memberships, they're only $30 a year. Also, while you're at it, buy your LSEO membership. They donate the room for free, and so there are donation boxes around that you can make a donation to help keep this going. Um, also, a thank you and appreciation to Shaw Spotlight, U of L, and the Lethbridge Herald for their support and coverage. And thanks for all of you for being here. Have a good day.